COVID-19 brought with it so many unique stressors, isolation, social inequities, depression, financial insecurity, substance abuse, and even bereavement. Today, I'm really eager to speak about what, in all honesty, seems like a totally obvious way to help manage COVID-19 loneliness. And yet, it's a method that many of us probably completely overlooked. Today's topic is group therapy. Hello there, this is Bradley and you're listening to Psych Everywhere, which is brought to you by PsychEye, the International Honor Society in Psychology. With me today via Zoom is Dr. Sherry L. Marmarash, an associate professor at George Washington University. She's also a licensed psychologist who's been practicing in DC more than 25 years. Among her many accomplishments, she is currently past president of APA Division 49, which is the Society of Group Psychology and Group Psychotherapy. Dr. Marmarash has published 40 or more articles on how groups and individual psychotherapy facilitate change. So in this episode, we'll be especially focusing on a 2020 article that she first authored, um, in the Journal of Group Dynamics, Theory, Research, and Practice. The title of that article is The Psychology of the COVID-19 Pandemic, a Group-Level Perspective. The purpose of this article is twofold. First, it's to explore why COVID spread so quickly according to group dynamic and group therapy theory. And second, to find out how people are coping with the prolonged isolation caused by the pandemic. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So how did you get interested in studying group therapy? You know, that's such a good question. I didn't know I was going to go into the area of groups. I went to grad school at Virginia Commonwealth University, and I was interested in health psychology. So I was interested in oncology patients and supporting cancer patients. And then I did a rotation through their counseling center. And Jack Corazzini was the director at the time and he was running groups and he was teaching the group therapy course. And I took the group therapy course as an elective because everyone said, take it. And then I was lucky enough to be one of the process observers in his therapy group. So I was sitting in the therapy group. Um, They met twice a week for an hour and a half each session. And the people had been there for years and I was floored by the process and the relationships in the group. Um, oftentimes I'd leave in tears. I was very touched by the way that the members reached out to each other. They were honest and genuine. And I remember the interventions and I thought if I could do something like this, it would feel like I had a huge purpose. Like it just felt really rewarding. So it kind of shifted things for me because I fell in love with the psychotherapy um, and didn't know I was going to feel that way when I went to grad school. I didn't know that's how I was going to feel until I did it. And then I said, you know, that's what I want to do my dissertation. And he became the chair of my dissertation with Don Forsyth, who was doing group research at VCU and an expert in groups. So I had like the social psych aspect and then I had the clinical aspect and it kind of shifted my career, kind of focusing on groups. And it was kind of serendipity because it wasn't something I planned. So I think a lot of people have probably only heard of group therapy in movies. Um, I think of like, there's a weight loss group in This Is Us. Um, There's a substance abuse group in Breaking Bad. But first of all, could you sort of tell us like, what is it really like? Like uh, how many people in a group and are there like ground rules for these groups and things like that? You know, it depends on the type of group. So there's lots of different groups. So some of the groups you mentioned are like support groups. And they're a little different than therapy groups. So you you have um, support groups, which are sometimes led by someone who is also a member of the group, but maybe has already worked on that issue. Like, so if it's substance abuse, but they may not necessarily be doing therapy. It's more like support around um, using a substance or eating or things like that. So it's very different. Um, A therapy group can also be really different depending on Um, the type of therapy group. So if you're doing a a relational interpersonal process group to help people um, learn more about themselves and relationships and what they bring to relationships. And a lot of it is here and now and getting feedback and a sense of belonging. Um, That is a typical kind of um, psychotherapy group that isn't always depicted in the movies. It's um, 
usually between five to eight people. Um, and it's uh, usually people who are pretty high functioning that can actually handle kind of feedback and engaging in conflict and kind of being honest with one another and genuine and learning what, what they do in relationships that holds them back from being satisfied. But there's other types of therapy groups too. So there's types that are very structured. There's CBT groups for anxiety disorder, disorders or social anxiety disorders or depression. They're more structured. There's DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy groups, which are also structured um, where they have homework assignments and tasks each week. So group therapy can look really different. Um, I think the difference between the movies, movies are trying to be dramatic, you know, so they want to pull you in. It, they don't want it to be boring. Otherwise you wouldn't watch it. Um, so sometimes it's probably not as dramatic, although group therapy can be pretty um, exciting at times. Um, I'm sure, you know, I think there's a new program out on Netflix called Group, and it's about a real group, and it tracks the group over time. And I think that's basically very realistic to a, a process group, so one that's kind of going on. Where it's a process feedback group. I see. So what are some of the benefits of group therapy maybe over these other kinds of therapy? Is, is, is it better? Well, you've already said you've already said that it's better for some people. To be honest, almost anyone could do a group. It depends on what type of group. So um, I would think there's a type of therapy group for anyone who wanted to do group. And what and what I really do feel strongly is that um, there's something you don't get an individual that you can only get in a group. Um, that doesn't mean people can't benefit from individual. I do a lot of individual therapy in my practice. And I think if you're in a crisis or you have trauma, there's certain reasons why individual therapy may be really helpful. But group therapy gives you something that individual can't, and it's the opportunity to have a real relationship with multiple people that are different and some that are similar. Um, and for you to also be in the role of helping others or engaging with others in a way that it's not that you're always the one talking and getting the attention and the empathy from a therapist. Um, group therapy is one where you're also asked to give to others and you're asked to listen and engage with others. So it offers an opportunity to see parts of a person that they may not be aware of. So for example, if somebody comes into individual therapy and they're telling me their story, I just hear their story and I'm listening. But if I'm in group and they're talking, but I see how they engage with other people, I might become more aware of some of the struggles they have. Like maybe it's hard for them to ask for time, or maybe it's hard for them to compete with someone else, or it's hard to get angry with someone when they interrupt them. So I get to see more parts of a person in a group because it matches more of kind of what's happening outside. And patients get something that you can't get an individual, which is that sense of belonging. Almost every group that I've run, including the APA, the short uh, video I did, at the end of the session, almost all of them were like, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't think I was going to feel a connection. I don't feel as alone. Like the first thing they said is, you know, there's other people like me who are in therapy. There's other people struggling with the same issues on campus. I didn't feel like no one talks about this when they're walking around. Everyone seems happy. I didn't realize I'm not the only one that feels this way or so, you know, that sense of connection you don't get from individual therapy. I think you get that from being with other people. I imagine there's also affordability. It is a for, more affordable. I, um, I mean, nowadays, everything is pretty pricey. So, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, it is more affordable. It's also offered in more places. A lot of people are um, offering group as outpatient treatment um, for different uh, issues. And so it's, there's also accessibility, like it might be easier to access a group than have individual after um, when you're in the community. Why, uh, why hasn't group therapy, do you think, been more prevalent in the past? You know what my feeling is, and I, you know, this is my opinion, I think we come in a very individualistic kind of culture. And so I think people tend to feel like if I get it myself, it's more, even our theories of change are, are more individualistic. Um, when we teach psychotherapy in graduate programs, we teach it individual therapy. I mean, and that is the thing we teach. So it's, I don't think it's based on how effective it is. Gary Burlingham's research has already shown there's a lot of equivalent outcomes with group and individual. So it's really based, I think, on our perception of that things go individually and that's how we've been thinking. And in our graduate programs, we require individual therapy. We don't require group therapy. And we really should because a lot of our um, graduate students go into 
agencies and placements where they're doing group therapy, but they don't have the coursework. And I think a lot of it's just based on that assumption that you focus on the individual. A lot of the theories that we focus on are individualized kinds of treatments that come from a very Western way of thinking about psychopathology and about issues and about development is about separation and the individual. So I, that's my guess it's, is that's part of the reason why, not because it's not as effective. I read in one of your recent articles um, that people with OCD have reported increased symptoms since the pandemic, um, like more hand washing, more fear of being contaminated. What are some other symptoms or other mental illnesses that might have also been sort of aggravated since the pandemic? You know, I see you know, a lot of um, patients that I'd already worked with have called to come back into treatment. And I think a lot of the research is showing you know, an increase in depression, a lot of increase in anxiety. Um, people have a lot more grief and loss that they're struggling with. Um, I think we also are seeing increases in relationship difficulties because, you know, a lot of couples struggle if they are confined into small spaces. So couples and families struggles, relational issues because of the stress. People don't have the access to other kinds of coping mechanisms that they may have used in the past. So I think it plays out with having more stress in relationships. And so you see more difficulties with relationships. Um, and you just see spikes in any mental illness that was already pre-existing. So if you take any mental illness, anything someone's struggling with, they're struggling with schizophrenia, or they're struggling with any kind of, you know, um, of diagnosis, bipolar disorder, and you add a lot of stress, you have increases in likelihood of having kind of recurrence of symptoms and having problems because stress kind of activates a lot of people's um, um, difficulties that they were struggling with. So you see a lot of increase in pre-existing conditions as well. These days, especially, there must also be virtual group therapy sessions. How do you think that those compare to the in-person? You know, so it's a good question. And we're doing some research to look at that because, you know, we really don't know. It's a lot of hearsay about people's experience. Um, I, overall, I think it's very effective compared to having no group therapy. So, I mean, having it be online is an incredible resource for people who wouldn't have access. So I think it's really, really great that we do have telegroup therapy. Um, I think it can be effective at people feeling connected and not feeling so isolated. In our clinic, we have, I'm supervising two groups that are online and the attendance has been great. Like they come each week and um, we reach out to, to people that, you know, would not be coming in if they could, you know, they're exposed to risk. So this is a good way for them to feel less isolated during a crisis. I think the hard part is you have a lot of things to consider. So for example, um, one of the things that we are looking at is the difficulty with eye contact and like the nonverbal. So, you know, if I'm looking at you, I'm talking to you. Um, it's obvious, but sometimes I'll make the mistake if there's a multiple people in the room and I'm looking at someone and I ask a question and then they don't know who I'm asking. And I'm like, oh, you know, I forget just because I look at you doesn't mean anything. There's a bunch of squares and, you know, we're all looking at each other. So that's one of the things you miss kind of the nuances. So if someone's shifting in their seat, when you say something or they lean in or lean out, it's very different online. You, it's harder to pick up. Um, and you can't really get that eye contact, which I think is really important um, when you're processing what people are saying as far as intimacy and connection and expression of feelings. Um, the other issue I think is that boundaries, you have to really educate group members about being in a place where you have some privacy. And some people really just don't have that. Like if you don't have a room with multiple people or boundaries, you have multiple people in the house, you really can't guarantee your safety. And so sometimes somebody will walk right in and you'll see someone walk out or there's dogs and pets and cats walking across the screen or someone blacks out their screen and you can't see them and you're not sure like what's going on. And so, you know, one of the things I've asked is people to have the screen on unless there's an emergency with the technology, but so that you can really see that the, what's going on in another person's um, view. Sometimes people will be like, oh, you can hear typing, <laughs> you know, or people are looking at their phones. You know, there's just so many distractions. It's because you're not really in the room. Like you'd maybe never pick up the phone if you were in a group with other people, but in your computer, you might look down and like pick it up or something. And so I think that's something that is interrupts the process and confidentiality, making sure that the group isn't being taped or that people are being 
kind of confidential on what, what's happening. So there's things to think about. Um, I think it's different. I think there's going to be some really good research that maybe looks at that. Um, you know, one of the things we're looking at is, you know, are some people more comfortable um, with that distance? And it actually is helpful to them in the group. Like they actually can talk more when they have that boundary versus if they were face to face, they would shut down. And is it the reverse for other people? For other people, they need that connection. And so this space creates a lot more um, emotional upset for them and they feel kind of more distanced and that is hard for them. So I don't think it's the same for everyone. I think there's probably a lot of cultural implications, you know, or some people because of their background, their culture, um, their own dynamic, their history, that the distance or the online format is better or worse for them. You know, so it'll be interesting. I think we'll, we'll learn more as we do it. One of the things that I, I haven't really asked too many questions about, but that's a big part of your article is group dynamic. Um, yeah. Uh, why do you think some of these small groups that are isolated because of the pandemic are doing really well, but then others are struggling, maybe even spiraling? I think it depends on the group. You know, there's probably a lot of what goes into groups as far as what makes groups cohesive. Um, and also kind of what is going on for the group. Sometimes groups can be very supportive and they allow for differences and they can feel like they're a secure base for members. So one of the things you think about is leadership, like who's leading the group. Um, and if it's a very healthy group or thriving group, you see that the leader might be very attuned to the group or the members are attuned to one another. There's room for disagreement and difference. There's enough similarity. There's an ability to feel a sense of belonging and connection and empathy towards one another. And so that group might thrive. Another group may have a leader that is uh, more um, maybe toxic or threatening. The group may feel a sense of paranoia that it's not safe. There may be a sense with the group members that they feel um, somehow uh, there's some deprivation, there's anger, there's hurt within the group. And so even the group, there's more of a sense of fearfulness versus a sense of security. And even though they may sense of belonging, they don't really feel safe or they may feel anxious or somehow um, cautious, not trusting. And so groups can take on, being on Dr. Lab about this, that groups can take on a certain kind of identity. And some groups can be very secure and some groups can actually be very um, anxious or overwhelmed or um, fearful. So, yeah. so it depends on the resources for the group, the leadership of the group, who are the members in the group. You know, there are a lot of factors. What are the environmental stressors on the group? You know, is one group being oppressed and deprived? Is the other group have resources and feels kind of secure? You know, so there are a lot of things like even systemically that influence the group dynamics as well. So you think that group therapy sessions, like the number of them is increasing? You mean like how many people are having access to group therapy? Yeah. It's increasing? I think it's going to be increasing. I think it's pretty large. Like um, one of my colleagues, Martin Whittingham, is looking at utilization of group therapy and all kinds of therapies. And you know, what's surprising is a lot of hospitals, that is their number one treatment outpatient. So when a patient's leaving and discharge, they go into a group. And even the VA hospital is using group therapy as kind of a major treatment for PTSD, for trauma, after people are, you know, just um, uh, leaving the hospital and outpatient treatment. So I think we're going to see more of it. And actually, I think with telegroup therapy, you might see more of that continuing even after COVID because of the convenience. Like I think a lot of, I think a lot of the group members appreciate having access and easy access to the group and having a sense of connection and having an ease at getting it compared to having to go somewhere or kind of have those appointments. So I think you're going to see more group and more online groups. That's my prediction. I think that's what we're going to see. We already see a lot of groups. I don't think people recognize how many group therapy treatments are out there. There's a lot of hospitals, a lot of patient care is group therapy. So one last question. Um, sure. Let's say somebody is on the fence, sort of undecided about whether they want to start going to therapy, gr group or otherwise. What would you say to that person? 
That's a good question. You mean for both, any kind of therapy? Like if, I, if I've done this before a lot of times, so say I have a friend and I'm like, I really think that therapy would help them. Uh-huh. I mean, usually I'll ask them, you know, like, tell me why you might not want to do it and try to listen to what their fears are. You know, a lot of people have very legitimate fears. It may be based on their culture or their religion or their values that they really feel a sense that I don't do that. Or I would feel shaming to seek help that way. Um, So I I definitely respect that for some patients, they feel like nervous about that. Usually what I say is, you know, it can be helpful to make a consultation. So you don't have to commit to therapy. You can have a consultation session, talk to someone and see what it would feel like. Is it a good fit or not? And you can ask questions or find out about it. Um, if you feel comfortable, you could watch, if you wanted to watch some videos on YouTube of therapy sessions, there's a lot of access to things now that are online. I use a lot of it in my psychotherapy course. So if somebody was kind of curious and didn't know what it was like, they could look up a YouTube on psychotherapy, watch what happens if they were frightened by it. Um, but I think the best thing is talking to someone just to see if it would be a good fit, go to one or two sessions and not have it to commit to anything. You know, that you could try something and if it doesn't work, you could not, you don't have to go for a long period of time. You can go for two sessions and see if you'd like it or not. I think people are scared because it feels like a big commitment and it's, um, you know, it's kind of frightening. I remember the first time I ever did therapy was very frightening. You know, I, I was very nervous. As a matter of fact, the first time I did it, I went to the intake, got so scared after the intake, I left and never, when they called, I never called them back. And I was in, you know, University of Florida. I was like, I'm not doing this. It's too scary. And then when I went to grad school, um, I decided I would do therapy because here I am in training and I'm learning to be a therapist. I need to be, I've had the experience. So I got into therapy um, and, you know, I think it's scary to try something new. So I have a lot of empathy for people who are nervous about it. It's kind of a big step to kind of go there, but I think it really is life-changing and it really can make a huge impact on your life. So I think it's worth it, but it's kind of scary to do that. Okay. Well, thank you so much. You've raised a lot of really good points. And I think the idea of people being able to sort of dip their toe in, that's that's really great. I'm, I'm sure that that's going to um, convince some people to kind of try it out. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's not the right fit, you know, you need to find a therapist that uh-huh. does work for you. You know, people might want a, a, someone who has a similar background to them. Um, or has, you know, experience dealing with something they're struggling with. So sometimes it's helpful to have one or two consults with different people and then find someone that you might like working with. Like you really do want to find someone you feel like you feel a sense of this person can get me. And you should feel that within the first two sessions. All righty. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's so nice to do this. And for grad school, this goes to grad students, right? Everyone, yeah. Uh Everyone, good luck. Uh (laughs) You picked a great profession. (laughs) You've just listened to another episode of Psych Everywhere. As you've hopefully noticed, the show has a lot of great things going for it. We've got great speakers, fascinating topics, and this totally catchy background music. (laughs) But there's one thing that we're a little short on, and that's reviews for the show. So if you have a minute or two to spare, please leave a quick review and rate the show. This really does help us get our content better disseminated to other podcast listeners. Here's one recent review that I'd like to share. You never know, maybe I'll share your review in the future too. MXEDPX wrote, I found the Psych Everywhere podcast to be so engaging and informative, and I hope they reach, well, everywhere. Today I'm catching up and making sure I didn't miss any. Bradley Cannon's interview questions are well thought out, and his guest speakers have all been incredibly gracious, informative, and inspiring. MXEDPX, thank you very much for writing that. You've made my day. This season's theme for the podcast is Psychology Has Answers, which is Psychi President Deborah Harris O'Brien's year-long initiative for the organization. So, On that note, look forward to lots of episodes showing how psychology has answers to major events in your life such as COVID-19, climate change, race, and more. Up next, Dr. Stephen Roberts is going to share with us about racism within the field of psychology itself. Check back in a week or so for that new episode and subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. Okay everyone, that's all for now. 
Talk to you again soon. Copyright 2021. Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. All rights reserved.